Good afternoon. It's 13.13 on the 24-hour clock, 1.13. But I like 13.13. There's my three, two times, and one. Another favorite number representing, of course, unity, the oneness of all. Uh, recently, listening to my meditation music, I heard someone bring up the name Ram Das, a long, a name long familiar to me. He was a lecturer at Harvard in psychology. His born name, born in 1931, born as Richard Albert. Two first names, interesting. But I've long admired him uh, since 1984. He's moved to the Mau to the island, Hawaiian island of Maui, and remained there ever since. Today's 87. Still teaching, still giving presentations in small audiences in on the Maui Island when, when he is up for it. But his early ex, uh, experiments with Timothy Leary and uh, spiritual effects of psychoactive drugs using drugs in as a tool towards spirituality. And another thing, among many things I like about him, his book, Be Here Now, which has become lingua franca, the language of the land, Be Here Now, almost to the point of triviality. It's lost its impact that it originally had from overuse. It's what happens when <laughs> you utilize, you overuse. So maybe that maxim, use it or lose it, should be modified. Judicious use, careful use or lose it. But the reason I mentioned today, he was in the mantra that I heard someone and his words, they referred to compassion and they talked about in compassion in the way that Ram Das, Ram das meant it when he called it Fierce grace. And that always resonated with me. I've heard him, I've heard compassion and this idea of fierceness. Instead of, we would think normally of compassion as almost pity feeling sorry. Sorry has become a synonym for compassion. But I never saw compassion as such a passive act. especially when we talk about suffering and the illusory nature of suffering and start to explore even some reasons behind suffering. Suffering as results of earlier deeds and lifetimes, uh, 
suffering does not have to mean solely a helplessness. Suffering has its useful side as well. But I never did see a compassion. Uh, understanding would be a better word for looking at the world around you and seeing the disparate, the inequities in life. Such things as hunger, thirst, inadequate housing. If we go to the realm of animals, we talk about abuse, abandonment, neglect, exploitation, and all these things. If you're a man of man or woman, if you're a being of awareness, has to tug at you at probably more than a singular level. And simple recognition of, oh, it's the way of the world. As if sounding dismissive isn't what is meant. Love of all beings. Doing what you can to alleviate senseless suffering or apparent senseless suffering. But as far as compassion, compassion seems to be a more enveloping, a more proactive, not a reactive response to events around you. So fierce grace which implies to me effort, focus, instead of passive resistance even to what is so, or what appears to be so, so rampant in our life. So many beings encompassed in suffering. And just as suffering can be non-personal, we tend to take it so personally. But do we take gravity? Do we take inertia? Do we take the laws of the realms of physics so personally? Couldn't we begin to think of suffering as a condition? Buddha talked about all life was suffering. Until you're in that pure state, until you've remembered what you've forgotten, you're bound to suffer. And it's in this light that I always looked at Buddha's proclamation of the inedibleness of suffering. Many critics and even pundits, supporters of the Buddha, really question this aspect of, do we have to have this worldview? Is this conclusive that 
life is a matter of suffering to one degree or another quantification of suffering if you will but I always took it to mean that somewhere within we remembered our pure state our state of being our state of recognition of Maya or the illusory nature of what we could only see and measure as life of life as life and it's this longing it's this buried memories that need to be resurrected and embraced it's the separation apparent separation from the oneness and this is only on a level of understanding of knowledge wisdom is the desired quant <laughs> desired destination of the accumulation of information intelligence understanding wisdom is the culmination of this path so this fierceness that we talked about is a dedication is an effort a striving until you realize that striving won't take you anywhere until you give up but it's this prompting, it's this echoes of memories that is the impetus. What impels instead of just being satisfied with what is compelling? What impels, what push? You feel the energy in impel. And compassion is equally an active state of grace as Ram Das says fierce grace fierce in the dedication towards embracing compassion but when I did my research I saw that he used this fierce grace as much when he talked about examination of fear and it was the fear of death that he was particularly still remains particularly focused and interest, interested in as this seems to be the universal the most alarming the most fearful of fears is the inevitableness of death death comes to us all and Ram Das has started foundations in his life dedicated to compassionate understanding of the end of life as we measure it in the physical form he's had places he set up the first as far as anyone knows in at least in the United States place that people could come to die consciously in a conscious state of grace this fierceness seems more appropriate when considering dealing with fears fear is an equal condition of life along with suffering 
to all but those who push beyond the veil, the illusory nature of both death and suffering, looking to the source, embracing the source, at the same time recognizing the inexplicable, unknowable nature of life. We as human beings simply don't have the faculties, the faculties necessary to understand the immensity of all encompassing life. We can feel it. We can almost touch it. We can become it. But as far as total understanding, we can barely, hardly even get more than a glimpse. Evolution, evolution of our souls as our paths, as we leave the necessity to have a human body and progress on the never-ending spiritual path, perhaps in another form, at another time, we will be blessed with a deeper understanding of the mechanics of what's so. But for most of us, it's only recognition and acceptance. That's all we need to do. But this fearness, fierceness, this idea of grace as a state that was obtained through constant, vigilant, guided, knowing efforts and constant work, as long as we remain in our physical form, constant work is necessary to maintain a state of grace. I've often referred to equanimity. Equanimity and grace are closely related, perhaps even sequential, to remain in a permanent state of grace by design includes mastery of equanimity. If you can face all that life throws you with the same degree of acceptance, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So many of these conditions that are available to us, there's the purity of silence, brought about by the discipline of working to tame, to control, and, if possible, silence the mind resulting in clarity, then you have acceptance of whatever life brings to you in a state of equality, maintaining your equilibrium.
not happening to forgive yourself too often. Although this is not something that you should take lightly. It's part of the process, is forgiveness, beginning with yourself, coming into the heart, reflecting to the world. So this is resulting in a state of equanimity. So I have clarity through silence, equanimity through the acceptance of what's so, without personal involvement, without, most importantly, judgment, equanimity, silence. And then we talk about grace. And the path to grace to me seems through compassion. And as this compassion becomes proactive, not reactive, not the feelings sorry for, but a giving of love that can go far to heal, to help the beginnings at least of healing to the people that seem to be suffering most. Compassion, selfless service, seva, doing something to help other people without accepting, without seeking recognition of any sort, not even a pat on the back, not even a words of encouragement, good job, job well done. It's the understanding of the endless love that's available, that we can tap into, that we can go, that dwells in our heart, that we can enlarge, expand, to envelop those closest to us in sequential, spherical, our spheres of influence, that you can expand this. And this expansion, this seva, this building of sangha, sangha is a spiritual family, this building of community, is, leads you to a state of grace. So these states, state of silence, state of equanimity, state of grace. Now there seems to be a crossroads in reaching the goal is to encompass them all. <laughs> but the mastery of silence is a very interesting one to me. I've spent much time talking about the nature of silence, what silence is not merely the absence of sound. There's a sound of silence, the seed, of silence is sound. The seeds for equanimity are acceptance and forgiveness, both on a personal and ultra personal level. Clarity springs from silence.
within clarity? What would be the opposite of clarity, anyway? Fuzzy? <laughs> Unclarity? Is there such a word? I don't think so. Not clear. We have to use the negative, maybe. I'll bust out my dictionary and look under antonyms for clarity. You, you out there have some that you could suggest. Unclear, muddy, cloudy, impure, but within clarity. The seeds of impurity must be there as well because the nature of things is that they include their diametrically opposite or seeming diametrically opposite states. It's a wholeness. Now, I practiced my practice was very much with ferocity, a fierceness. I fiercely kept myself focused on what I wanted from this lifetime, from this experience. There is a fierceness in my practice. Renzai Zen only encouraged this fierceness. After all, this is the Zen of the samurai, the Zen of the warrior. But I've mentioned before, and it's worth mentioning again, that this ferocity this fearness serves to keep you focused and it's not without its uses. But I believe that, that there's a time when fierceness is surrendered through the process of giving up this fierce dedication to awakening is perhaps, or is, the last obstacle to waking up. But you needed this fierceness. And as all tools all steps, wisdom comes, or maybe it's frustration, lack of success, something motivates you to question what's not working. And I love this question of what's not working. That's what my mind is all about. That's the purpose of my mind, to sort, to store, to acknowledge, to discover what's not so, leaving behind that which might be so. Once it's determined that it's not so, it allows you energy and resources to examine other, even tightly held concepts. You notice I avoided the word belief because I think within the word belief, you can see the obstacles that having beliefs present entail. 
I would encourage you to examine beliefs, to not accept them without rigorous examination and maybe ultimately discarding any beliefs, freeing up room, space for what might be so. So this idea of fierce grace, I think is a tool, but as the other tools, there's a time when its usefulness is long past. Now I have no way of talking to Ram Das, but I would speculate, dare to speculate, that he too has adopted has chosen to discard this ferocity as he's an 87 year old man we tend age graces us with simplicity if we're doing it right simplicity non-judgmental understanding that efforts, no matter how well intended, ultimately can only take you so far. Their terms of usefulness expire. And I remember experiencing this in my own life and only then, with the recognition of letting go through surrender, through giving up, my most closely held ideas, concepts, as no longer, as no longer, not only being less than useful, but actual impediments to what was necessary, the state you had to attain to cross from progressive, non-abiding awakening over the threshold to permanent abiding awakening knowing full well as you cross this threshold there's absolutely no turning back <laughs>